guys. Welcome to the New Share Podcast. Trek here. Uh, if you're new here for the first time, this is the Spearfishing Podcast where I interview spearfishing experts, authorities, and characters from around the world. Today, I'm down the Central Coast. It's part four of the East Coast Australia uh, tour that I did a couple of weeks back. Uh, these Central Coast guys, we went out to the pub where they sort of have their normal club meetings, and about half a dozen of them joined me, and we just had a good roundtable discussion, particularly about headland hunting and some of the conditions they face on the Central Coast. A, a top bunch of guys that are also patron listeners to the uh, podcast as well. So it was super cool to be able to get them on the show and go and do that. Uh, it's always done thanks to patrons. And uh, I'm going to read out a patron message in just a second. But before we get there, a couple of quick shout outs. River Mungle says, hey, Shrek, uh, River here from Hawaii. My friend who's a lifeguard shared this really interesting podcast episode about a lure maker who talks about the relationship between fish and noises. I thought it would be a really awesome topic for you listen to i had a quick listen uh thanks river uh it's called it's it's episode 30 of the australian lure fishing podcast and he's, he's talking specifically about lures and what lures fish like but he talks about the frequencies that fish hear sound at and um and the episode is called the truth about what fish hear and, and don't and uh some really interesting stuff here particularly with some of the technology we're seeing coming out around fish rattles now um Noob Spirit Podcast, Neptonics have got a fantastic one in a stainless tube and basically you can rattle that thing down the bottom and use it as another particular type of attractor. Um, so River, right on, on point there buddy with uh, sending me that, thank you very much. A quick review on a Jobfish Lungbuster Tea on the at noobspirit.com. Matt says, love the Jobby Lungbuster Tea, Keep the, keeps the froth and stoke alive when I'm out of the big blue. So cheers for that Matt. Also while we're there, Father's Day, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, is coming up. It's right around the corner. It's about two weeks away. So check out the Spiro Dad tees available on noobspiro.com. There's long sleeve and short sleeve. I've even got a windbreaker there as well, made by Champion, funnily enough. Um, really good stuff. Spiro Dad, can't go wrong. Uh, have a look at the picture. It's a neat concept. Um, it's basically just me standing there in a pair of Roman sandals with a spear gun. You'll, you'll have a look. Check it out at noobspiro.com, the Spiro Dad. Um, T, I freaking love it. Yeah, also available in a short sleeve as well. David says he's been, he bought, well, he, I think he submitted a recipe originally for 99 spare recipes. The digital edition is now available. However, the print edition is just a little bit away, probably still a month and a half off hitting shelves. So, but that's a quick update. David says, hi Shrek, the crispy skin with the salsa verde by Chef Man. I think Daniel Man is an absolute winner. The tips on prepping the skin work to treat. Looking forward to my next culinary mission with the 99 Spare Recipes book. P.S. The coral trout was paired with a beautiful West Aussie red. So awesome, David. Stoked you getting in there and experimenting with some of the recipes in the book. Um, Steve also says, this book is amazing. Such a great idea, and the turnout was beyond imagination. Thanks again. Uh, I think we're nearly into some of the last shout-outs. Oh, quick, a fundraiser by Trevor Kitchen. The Inter-Pacific Spearfishing team are trying to raise some money so they, they can get over to there. I think it's French Polynesia. Um, check it out. They're going remote. Um, there's a really good video up there from Trevor explaining. So just, just type in. Um, GoFundMe Trevor Kitchen or GoFundMe into Pacific Spearfishing Team Fundraising and get on there and help that crew out. There's five of them trying to get over there. Um, it's not cheap. Conrad, talking about patrons before funding trips. Conrad became a patron recently. He said, he said, hey, Shrek, I'm based in the outskirts of Sydney, originally from NZ, where I still enjoy going back to dive with my old mates. I want to sincerely apologise for being tighter than a slimy mackerel's arsehole and listening to almost your entire catalogue up until now for free. Keep up the awesome work, mate. Your podcast is great to listen to while I'm working and also, sadly, when I'm not in the water. My nine-year-old son loves listening to your podcast. Also, he's stoked at the moment as we're going to be going out soon and trying his first spear gun out. Look out, leather jackets and red mowies. Pierce, have James Sacker back on. He's an interesting bugger. Um, awesome. Thanks, Conrad. Um, Guys, this podcast is very much a community effort. I really appreciate all the encouragement, the thanks, the sharing the message and spreading the, you know, the, just the good stuff that happens at the podcast with your mates. I really appreciate it. Thanks ex for the extra mile people that have jumped on the podcast as patron listeners at patreon.com forward slash Newspiro. Much appreciated. Uh, to partially celebrate that, episode 200 is going to be a blinder. I am trying to do a Where Are They Now episode, basically get um, some information from all of the guests that have been on the podcast about what they're up to now and some of the stuff they've listened um, 
learned along the way. And it'll be great to get some voice messages from you guys, the listeners to the podcast as well. Um, if you go to noobspira.com, head up into the menu, there is a Nooba Stories section and you can leave an up to three minute voice message that I want to include on episode 200 which will very much be a community special. So I hope you jump on there and do that. Noobspero.com, head up into the Nooba Spirit, uh, Nooba Story section, leave me a voice message. But hey, massive intro today. Thanks for bearing with me. Let's get into today's episode with the Central Coast Sea Lions boys, headland hunting and all good things Central Coast. Here we go. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses, courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out, and if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store. Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash, and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it and dive it. Neptonics is a one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. G'day, guys. I'm a bit sport tonight. We're in some good company. I've got the Central Coast Sea Lions, or half of the ex-presidents here anyway, and the current president as well. So um, let's head around the table and introduce ourselves. We'll start off with Al because he's actually been on the podcast before for a full episode. Go and check that out. The Art of Taking Noob Spearfishing. I believe it's like the second or third most popular episode Ever. Like, I think nearly 10,000 downloads of that one episode, so... That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good to finally meet you, Shrek, anyway. Yeah, Great. yeah. Glad Hunt. you came down. Yeah. Introduce yourself, though. Well, what do you do, Albie, day to day? And... Oh, mate, I'm, well, I'm actually a um, tree lopper by trade. Um, just do it for the lifestyle. really like the like working outdoors and, yeah, just being um, out in the fresh air every day. And in my spare time, just try and get in plenty of diving. So, so it it's pretty much takes up all my time. And you're an ex-president of the club? Yeah, I am actually, yeah. 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 You guys have got an awesome club going down here. I mean, it's 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 a decent size, but but beyond that, it's got a, it seems to have a good culture, you know? Like we organize this 24 hours. More than half a dozen blokes showed up. A couple of them have bought me beers, so it's a pretty good culture in my Hey, we've got a fantastic club and everyone gets along really well. Yeah. Um, we just have so much fun when we when we go out diving and it's just all about the mateship and camaraderie. It's not, not too much about the, the points or, you know, or who shot what and yeah. it's all just about the fun and, and hanging out and you know, diving some cool locations and having some good experiences really. Yeah, sick. Sick. You guys have like a social night once a month or something or what's the... We have a meeting. We actually have it here um, at Breakers. Uh, been having meetings here for, I think, about 25 years now. Yeah, since 1996, 1997. Yeah. Uh, before this one was built. Yeah, so Andrew actually is one of the people that started the meeting, so... Let's go to Andrew next then right, and we'll I'll come back Andrew to Josh on. in a sec. Andrew, introduce yourself, mate. Hey, Shrek. Uh, yeah, so my name's uh, Andrew Pierce. Yeah, so I um, yeah live here on the on the Central Coast and was one of the founders of the um, Central Coast Sea Lions. Also, the club was around in the 60s and 70s, and I think a lot of the spearfishing, for, for whatever reason, seemed to... Um, deteriorate or, or drop off back in the by about the 80s thereabouts and then about the mid 90s um there's a there's a couple of us that sort of got into this got into the sport and um and met up one time at one of our local dive shops at uh, Coffs Harbour old fellow by the name of Carlo down there had a, a do- sorry Coffs Harbour at Gimine I should say had a dive shop there and we put a little ad in the in the uh on the wall in the in the shop and um next minute we were uh, organizing a meeting at another uh, the other um person who founded it with um Glenn Bath and um the two of us met up and um, and a couple other people and the rest is sort of history. So, yeah, we've had meetings here in this location at the Country Club since 1996, 97, thereabouts. Yeah. What's kept you in the lifestyle of spearfishing for this long? Uh, there's a combination of things. There's obviously there's the, the, the fitness element to it, the outdoors. And, yeah, n- uh, was, none of you blokes look unfit. I'm, I'm in good company, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I, keep... I feel like the slob here, so that's always yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. 
So uh, I guess unfortunately, though, because of the, the weather that's been in the, in the last few years, I've probably done less diving the last sort of couple of years than what I have in the, in the previous 30 plus how, years. How many dive days are you getting in a year? Because everyone has their own measure of it and it's never enough. Yeah. Look, for me, you know, like many of us, we end up having many kids and careers and things like that. So, yeah, so it's, uh, it reduces. But, uh, but look, you know, when you're young, you're out there every weekend. And after work in the afternoons and the like, but um, yeah, for me personally, I'll probably get out, you know, maybe um, 15 weekends a year these days, but hopefully to, uh, we'll look to increase that and get some more dives in after work when daylight saving hits us and the like. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. What does daylight savings mean? You, you, summertime, you just get a long evening, straight after work, you can jump in and, and, and plug a few brim. That's exactly right. You can finish work and not just plug brim, it coincides with summer here on the coast, which is our pelagic season. And uh, for a few of us, it means the opportunity to get out there and um, get a few jewfish or uh, kingfish, uh, yeah, desirable right. species. So uh, I think I'm, you know, the boys well know that uh, that's one of my specialities. And uh, yeah, and I certainly enjoy that time of year. We all do when it's nice and warm and, uh, and you've got that extended daylight. And you can be in the water till like eight o'clock or so. I want to just quickly, before we move around, I just wanted to hammer on jewies because I'm not good at them. I've come across them in the open in big schools and I haven't shot anything over I think 10 or 11 kilos, so school is pretty much. Shooting big jewies seems to be about having the courage and the sense to be able to navigate difficult headlands and swell and get underneath it and uh, have a good look. Yeah, so look I mean, certainly on the north coast of New South Wales, they tend to be more of a headland, get under the whitewater thing here. But on the central coast, and the same would be for northern Sydney, um, that sort of summer period from November, I always say a bit of a running joke amongst the guys here is Melbourne Cup Day, as I always say, is when they, when they turn up. <laughs> uh, so from Melbourne Cup Day, I'll start diving. Uh, but uh, you, you find here that it's not just the white water, but it's actually you know, against the headlands and the like in sort of the deeper holes. And it's, it's really a game of, yes, there are places where they're more persistently there, but it's also a game of just covering as much territory as possible of an afternoon. And um, So and you, fa- yep. you fancy yourself a bit of a swimmer? Yeah, yep. Yeah, love a good swim. I'm Again, a bit, the fitness. I'm, a, I'm more of a drifter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but everyone's so. got a distinct style. So I think people that cover a lot of ground maybe have some success with what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Cover a lot of ground. You don't need to be a deep diver, as yep. many of our my uh, our friends here will attest. Um, uh, knowing that it's you know it's it's covering that deep ground, looking in those holes and gutters, and uh, and uh, yeah, and I said you don't need to be a deep diver. And you know you tend to find them in you know the ones, twos, threes, up to a dozen or so. They're a lot easier to approach. They're opposite the kingfish whereas when you get those big schools that you're talking about i've seen them up the north coast and you just can't get near them half the time yeah yeah the, some of the days i've had it you're underweighted too because you're so shallow it's very easy to um overweight yourself i think for dew diving and it's sometimes appropriate when you're in that shallow water but it's just a delicate old balance i think sometimes you know yeah yeah mm. Awesome, Andrew. Let's have a chat with Josh, the current serving president of the Central Coast Sea Lions. He's been voted up once. Um, Simon said it was a dubious honour when he was voted president. But uh, what do you th- what do you say, mate? Oh, mate, I definitely enjoy it. I think um, just kind of having that new vibe into the club is is good. But yeah, big shoes to fill. You know, we've had Albie had the reins for a long time, and and Simon had the reins. So you know, there's definitely that sense of pressure that I've got to come up with the goods for sure for the club and keep that froth level pretty high. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Oh, just you know, a bit of banter, like Albie was saying before. Like, there's a few guys in the club that love a bit of a laugh and joke, and so you know, if I'm not weighing any fish, they're happily you know pointing the finger at me and having a bit of a laugh, and <laughs> yeah. vice versa. You know, if they're not weighing in fish, I'm gonna rub it into them. So this kind of keeps that stoke with everyone and a nice, friendly little community that we've got here. As club president, it's uh, you, you must feel a sense of responsibility about getting the noobs engaged. It sounds like you guys have got some good strategies to do that. Um, how do you do it, and how do you? What's your advice to other clubs wanting to grow their sort of their their, their entry level base? I think um, the start of it is when when we have those club days, and you know you might have a boat lined up for yourself, and you've got those new um, divers that have come in. I think you got to put yourself with those divers and kind of try and promote the froth of those guys so often you know if it means passing up a boat day and and doing a rock hop with them just getting them used to it and kind of just teaching them little things along the way um also just helps with the safety aspect of it depending on where we're diving the conditions in the day and whatnot being the president you know you have those difficult calls that you do need to make but we're pretty lucky that we've got some experienced divers in our club that can help us or help myself you know make that right call and help those noobs not putting them in a position where i wouldn't want to be in yeah yeah 
It's investing into the future too, isn't it? Like it, sometimes it, it seems like a big trade-off, like finally some good weather rolls around and shit, I've got to take out you know a couple of new blokes. They definitely restrict your day's diving, so you are making a sacrifice, but, but speak to that if you can. Yeah, I think you, you definitely do make that sacrifice, but I just look back to when I was a noob Spiro and you know, you're crying out for those older guys, that experience to, to take you out and show you the ropes. Um, and you know, sometimes that means that they might not get the fish that they're chasing for the day. But I think they also get that bit of stoke and seeing that um, younger diver come through and shoot a really nice fish that he hasn't shot before. And just kind of sharing that moment, I think is really special. Yeah, yeah. I told, we were in coughs and I'm not pointing Cam out. Cam shot a couple of kingies, but he hasn't shot anything big and they were around in coughs. And I told the boys that, oh, Cam hasn't shot a, a decent kingie. The whole boat's focus. And you know you're in a good company when everyone just switches to like, right, we've got to get this guy one of these fish. And so it all became about putting Cam like on that first sweet dive when in you're just encountering the school. And everyone's, you know, because we all could have sh shot kings, but we're just holding back. Or well, someone shot a king and then let it hang so the rest of the school come around. But um, there is sacrifice in taking new, new guys, but I think there is reward, that vicarious sort of energy you get from watching a guy shoot something for the first time. So Yeah, definitely. Like a few of my mates um, have kind of just come into the sport and they started out doing a bit of cray diving. And so getting them there first, decent cray and, and watching them kind of pull it out from the from the hole and then just have that little froth moment on the surface I think you know you do live through that like you and you'll always remember those moments with your yeah. best mates. Have the Easterns come in down here and what other lobster do you get around? Are you getting all nates and what it what what, what do, you, are you get, do you get southerns up this far or? No mainly no. you just get the the Eastern rock lobster. I have seen a couple of those ornates rock up every now and then but yeah, very, very rarely. But um, they're definitely around now. So there's a few bit getting caught, but um, we're just a bit unlucky at the moment with the, with the floods down here where we've got some really brown water hanging in, so it's kind of just stopping us from getting out. But I was, yeah, I was hoping that I was going to get out this weekend and, and pepper a few, but it turns out that's not going to be the case. Now, we're going to move on, Josh. We're going to go to Mark, my favourite Central Coast sea lion already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he brought me a bottle of rum. So, Mark, you're my you, favourite. You, you must be the best that. Spiro in this club, mate. <laughs> mate, if you say so. But, uh, still your best mate the next morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll hate him, eh? Hey, yeah. Keep that on the lowdown. Yeah, right. Eh? <laughs> what rum? Yeah, yeah what rum? Uh, yeah, so... Tell us about yourself, mate. What um, what have, what have you had to do with the club and what, what do you love about being part of it? Okay, so yeah, pretty new to the club, pretty new to the Central Coast. Yeah, right. Only been here for probably three years now. Um, did a bit of diving in Sydney when I was living there. Only on and off because yeah. I was living a bit far from the coast and it was just too hard to make everything happen consistently. Um, moved up to the coast. Uh, looked for a bunch of guys that were spearfishing, found the Central Coast Sea Lions, found found a bunch of guys that were, you know, really happy to, to help out, not only for club days, but, you know, take you out during the week when it, you know, conditions were good outside club meetings and, yeah, it's been really I good. I can see why you'd be popular immediately. <laughs> 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 no, I yeah. think like you've got that energy. It's it's great to be in a good club of people that are just friendly and and share the same passion as you. Where did spearfishing start for you? Like where did where did this uh, lifestyle start for you? Yeah, so it probably started. Um, I don't know, maybe twenty years ago. I got a couple of mates down in Sydney um, that dived with the with the dolphins there. Oh yeah, um, San Susi crew, San Susi dolphins. Yeah. yeah, so Daniel Galea and guys like that that kind of. Um, got me started, but um, yeah, that was probably the beginning days of it. Um, but yeah, more so coming up here really got me yeah, got right. me into it. The guys up here have been awesome. Um, I've got my own boat now, but prior to that, you know, you know, jumping on somebody's boat, as I was saying, you know, and Josh was saying, taking guys out, taking newer guys out, I was sort of still a bit green. Um, in the beginning, but yeah, a lot of the guys are taking me out. Is that your first boat? First boat that I've owned. Done yeah. a lot of fishing on boats yeah. before, but yeah, first boat that I've is, owned. That sense of responsibility when you're the skipper, it's a bit of a thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. To walk so, us through like the first time you took out a bunch of guys diving for the first time and you were the skipper. Yeah, you know, actually, this boat's only fairly new. I've only dived off it a couple of times. Um so, yeah, haven't really done too much of that, taking new guys out yet. 
but um, definitely something that you know you need to pay for because Alby and people like that and you know Andrew have taken me out on their boat so yeah definitely something that you know other guys in the club need a boat ride well yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So hopefully this shit weather clears out. <laughs> you guys get some clean water and uh, people put their phones on silent and uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cam. He's been with me the whole trip. Cam's been my right-hand man, so I yeah, can't yeah. begrudge him too much. Yeah. But um, fantastic, mate. I, I hope you keep enjoying it. And um, next time I come down, you'll probably be president. <laughs> so uh, we've got a line of them Depends here. Depends so. how much rum gets around the place. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome, mate. Well, let's say again uh, hello to Simon Horvath again, who we uh, interviewed recently. Well, it was today, but you probably heard it a couple of weeks ago. Depending on how much we've got to cut out. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's turned into a 10-minute interview. It was 45. Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, and that's another thing as well about the club you kind of forget about is the outside environment that's created through the club as well. So... You know, we create the Facebook page and the members page and a few of the divers get on and I was lucky enough for someone like Dave, you know, he put me on the boat not knowing me the first time and, uh, you know, I probably made a couple of the classical noobie, noob moves, you know, I didn't bring a uh, banana on the boat or anything like that but I wasn't quite sure and once I'd learned to help with the anchor and help with this and help with that and I learned to treat his boat with respect, all of a sudden I was getting a message from him out of club comps, out of hours, going, hey, I'll, I want to go for a run on the coast this week. Are you interested? Yeah, awesome. And all of a sudden you start creating these friendly groups that are the club but also outside yeah, the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all of a sudden someone goes, oh, I'm free this weekend. We should go, you know, go north or we should go for – or what you know today I've got to get the kids to soccer this afternoon but let's go for a dive in the morning and you then create this there's this community of the club and it's not just about comps yeah. or not just about obviously not about club meetings but you've got this social Network. environment of all like-minded divers do you think that's a measure of a good club where it starts spawning you know just personal more relationships between the members outside of the club absolutely yeah, yeah. Right. The, not just the divers will dive for the comp but you know and even checking on each other as well during COVID and hard well, times. Well, you'd have to with blokes like Albie. Yeah. He throws himself off things and that and yeah, breaks everything in his body. Yeah, everyone looked looked for, looked for after, looks after yeah, each other, makes sure everyone's awesome. doing well. So, yeah, and it's a crazy environment. And, you know, even from the ends of, you know, it's just after I brought my house, someone was like, does anyone know a tradesperson? Yeah, we know a tradesperson. Like, we ah, can help man. you out. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely that, it, that social environment the club creates um, is, is just so much bigger than what, some people might assume it would be. Love it. Well, Simon, you've done a whole heap for lobbying fishing rights. We, we talked about it in your interview, but, mate, um, hats off to you for all of the involvement you've had in doing some of that difficult behind-the-scenes work. And a lot of that work is thankless. It's uh, People don't know what you've done, but um, some of us do, and so hats off to you. Oh, thank you very much. And, look, I appreciate that, but there's a whole group of people who... Um, work so hard as a group and I think that's the only way we managed to get things done. Um, we had all sorts of people coming from all sorts of walks in life and even if it was, hey, look, I can't go to these meetings with you but I'll donate 20 bucks to do the next run of pamphlets that we're giving out to yeah, the public sick. or whatever else. Yeah. Like it, it was a huge group effort and that's what made it so important and so productive. You know, we would have lost a lot of room on the coast for that. So, yeah. Let's let's say hello to Dave because yeah. um, Dave's my second favourite bloke. He bought me a beer. Um, oh, me, Dave, intru yeah, introduce yourself, mate. Yeah, hi, I'm Dave, but uh, everyone calls me Tomo. Okay. Tomo, you've been in this club and in this area quite a long time. Talk us about where it all started for you with the Central Coast Crew. So we, with the Central Coast uh, Sea Lions, I, I've been a member for probably about eight years, maybe nine years. Yeah, right. Eh? And um, I first started because uh, I've always been very sporty and then my um, playing over 35 soccers and things like that. My knees were starting to give out on me, so I need another hobby. Mine did that in my 30s, so like early 30s, so you lasted a bit longer. Well done. So I'd... Um, Low impact in the water. That's what you were going for. That's, that's right. So I'd initially started spearfishing probably uh, very late teens, early 20s um, with pole spears and pranger heads and things like that. Didn't really know what I was shooting at the time, but I love getting in the water. It's a totally different world. My profession had me uh, away from Australia for many years, so that kind of dropped by the wayside. But uh, when my knees failed, I thought, oh, let's get back into it. So I researched 
And uh, I don't actually live on the Central Coast. Okay. I live about 40, 45 minutes away. Uh, but it's easier for me to get up here than it is to the Northern Beaches Club. So I contacted the Central Coast Sea Lions and uh, found out that they had the meeting, came, joined up, and the uh, rest is history. Yeah, right. And you like diving up here down, versus down there? Like um, most of the diving you do, at, you've got a 17 hour you were telling me about proudly. Correct. Uh, it sounds like a great whip. Um, are you diving most of the time up here? Or are you diving down there? Like, most of the time up on the Central Coast, uh, either by boat or rock hopping. Uh, as Simon has said, um, you know, we'll message and, and sometimes it's just more convenient to meet up somewhere and go for a dive off a headland. And, no um, boat to clean. Correct. And, yeah. and quite often or not, no fish to clean either. <laughs> <laughs> you guys do get some filth water down here. It must be tough sometimes. If you get offshore, if you poke out, is there a dirt line? that you run into at some point where, where the water suddenly cleans up or is it just shit all the way? <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you guys have... <laughs> so, yeah, I wouldn't be able to say how far, but um, looking at satellite imagery at the moment, it uh, extends pretty much like 30k out. Uh, most of the time, though, um, if it hasn't been raining, if we do a fad run, we come back in maybe from, like, kilometre you can see a, a nose will change in the colour of the water yeah. and then you'll get in so and um Shrek asked before how many days a year do you think we get that are five metres or more and yeah I, I was said, asking I how said, many divable days with decent viz you're getting here on the central coast I said and obviously like you got La Nina disrupting everything and you get your shit years and you get your good years but if you could average it out um Simon thought it was as many as half what do you guys think? Five metres or yeah, more. Half. half, yeah. We just had a bad run the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, guys. We were discussing viz and we were discussing diveable days on the central coast, five metres or more. You guys are all sort of speculating. I've heard a number of people say half. Josh, you were... Yeah, about that. But I was going to say, like, in winter time is generally yeah. the, like, the best... Um, viz that we get and it lets us dive a, a lot of areas that we usually can't get to during like that summer time you've got that howling nor'easter or you've got a lot of rain um because we're limited uh, by the hawksby river that comes out and tends to flow north and so a lot of those south coast um not south coast those south southern areas of the central coast uh typically we can get into in the winter times yeah right awesome cray diving like some of the biggest crays that i've seen on the coast come from the, those areas i think that's because Quite often, like if it's been a bit of rain and it's dirty, not many people want to go down to that end and dive the dirty water. But once you've kind of got it um, sussed out, you can go back to those days where there is a little bit, um, how are you going? And it's under that five metre mark and you can still do some quite good uh, cray diving. Central Coast has got a bit of surf too though and you guys quite often have a decent swell knocking in. Headlands can be a scary place when you've got even 1.8 metre swell is, can be a bit hectic. Uh, are you guys have you guys got a lot of northerly aspect type headlands? So because look, I'm, I'm ignorant here, but it seems to be a predominantly southerly type swell that you guys are getting. Is that is that right? We get the the south swells and the, and the easterly swells, but we do have a few spots that you can definitely get in and out of that that southerly swell. But I suppose when it kind of swings around to that east, it gets a bit more difficult in where you want to go. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, look, we, we've got a lot of good headlands here that give you know a bit of protection from the southerly. That is a predominant um, swell direction. But we've got it good here. Like I said, yeah, probably half of the year we can dive. And if, if it's not so much the water clarity, although it has been the last couple of years, it's the swell. And look, I can go back to where I learned to dive on the north coast of New South Wales. My local spot I used to dive was Broken Head, which is now Marine Park and Lennox Head and what have you. I was um, there in my uh, 18, 19 when I was years of age in, uh, in the early 90s. And um, I moved here to the Central Coast and it was heaven because it was the opportunity that you could just jump off a headland and have um, and reef offshore you could swim to. It wasn't stirred up sand where it just re uh, headlands just dropped to sand. So we do have a good here and obviously other areas up in you know southern Queensland like you've got to have a boat and the like so uh, to get out to the reef. So you can jump off the headland here and basically swim and swim and swim to the next headland and have reef the whole way. But uh, yeah, so at least, at least half the year we can dive. I just like to say Google Maps is really good because if yeah. you can check your, your weather apps and find out what 
direction the swell's coming from and look at the wind. Uh, Google Maps is your friend. You can have a look what is facing the opposite direction, Love especially it. for rock hops. New South Wales has got a good fisheries app too. You can learn a lot about the behaviour of some of the bigger species and you start to learn about what you what you need to look for. What are, what are your reliable weather apps in this area? Because, like, I'll be honest, in Queensland, I'm using Willy Weather sometimes and it's decent. Um, but I know that in different parts of the country, people just go, oh, that's a piece of shit. But what do you guys think? Yeah, look, Shrek, the, the most reliable weather app is hop in the car for us and drive down and have a look at the local headland. Because <laughs> a lot of the other things are based on, um, on obviously, modelling and um, and the Bureau, the Bureau of Meteorology uh, probably your forecast hasn't been the most accurate, in uh, my opinion, over the last oh, 100%. few years. Oh, 100%. You, you're better yeah. off chasing Higgins Storm Chasing yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. one of those other boats. Yeah, like, yeah. So yeah. definitely, you just can't beat going have a look. Office doesn't give you a forward forecast, but even if you go on the Bureau site and you have a look at the um, the observations and see the wind speed at the local, local weather station, station at our Nora Head Lighthouse. Um, so there's that. But then other than that, there's the whole bunch of them. They're all pretty much the same, um, in my opinion, in terms of that they rely on pretty much the same modelling, I think. So. Yeah, they, they all draw from bomb data, don't they? Especially for offshore as well. Like, it might be windy on the coast, but it'll, it can, you can show those little offshore areas where, you've, uh, where the fat is and whatnot, and it'll say, you know, oh, it's going to be one to three knots or something. And um, you can still dap out there for a, for a dive. So you got a wave rider bo- boy, sort of something like that, that's measuring swell height and uh, and gap between sets. Yeah, the wave rider boys off Manly. Okay. Um, which it's quite a way south. Funnily enough, it, it as the crow flies from here to Sydney isn't actually all that far, but to drive it's quite a long time. Yeah. Um, right. So the wave rider boy in Manly, it'd be what forty k's from here, about forty k's. Um, but yeah, and the other one we use on a for a safety call is just the text written um, that's written at 4, 15, 10, and 2 sometimes okay. um, from the Bureau. the mid, the mid the, And that'll basically just say swell height, sea height, and wind. Ah, yeah. And um, generally when it says uh, dangerous warning is for the club perspective, that's generally a call off for a competition um, because they could look at you and say, why'd you run a comp with the dangerous swell warning? Um, the only thing that can kind of be mucked around with is in winter when you get like a 40 knot offshore wind. Yeah. So it's dead flat. Um, and as long as you've got people who are capable at the helm, uh, then then you're all right. Um, you know, you've still got a, a really strong westerly that, that probably not as much as 40 knots, but, you know, that can be... Um, it's still pretty safe yeah. diving. And inshore stuff as well, like the land's giving you a bit of shelter from yeah. the wind as well. Yeah, yeah. some good cliffs here, and those yep. cliffs protect you from that westerly wind. And I can certainly think of a number of times where I've gone out and uh, might have been the only boat that's actually left the boat ramp. And people think you're mad going out in it, but it's a due west wind and it's blowing straight over the top of the cliffs and it's absolutely like a mill pond sitting off the yeah. rocks. As long as you're not two k's off. Yeah. 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 But it's a good way. Like boats give you so much access to so much more ground. Like instead of having a dive a headland and go, oh, there's not much going on today, you do a quick drift, you have a quick look, one, two, three, you, you, maybe you know your three pressure points on that, that thing, boom, you're back in the boat, next headland. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the new Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com, get Adam's course and use the code Spiro to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I could trust when I pull the trigger. Killshot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Killshot Spear Guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden gonna get you down and 
shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times, but there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximise the time that you have there. Learn at noobspiro.com forward slash TED with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course, noobspiro.com forward slash TED. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash TED. Before we were talking about the number of days that we could dive, and, and it's actually just um, made us think here that um, over the more recent years of when in the club, we've sort of, I guess, improvised, adapted and overcome from the point of view of when it's dirty inshore, we've found something else to do. We basically now you know, do a lot more diving out of the fads for dolphin fish and the like. So that's something that's really developed. We didn't do as much of that years ago. But, uh, do you get wahoo out there? Look, a couple of us. I, I certainly shot a wahoo who were here a couple of years ago, not big, and I've seen a few. Um, the old tree drifting down and, and, and we'll have in, um, with, with a school of wahoo on it once and, and a few. But, yeah, around that sort of six, seven kilo, which is, you know, lengthwise still good fish. But, yeah, I've never seen a big wahoo, Audi. The floods did gift us with some floss dams. And flotsam. Flotsam, yeah. Jetsam. Jetsam. Yeah, jetsam, yeah. What's yeah, the difference yeah. again? Oh. There's, a, yeah. there's a rule. Is it jetsam's below the surface, floatsam's floating? Uh, I can't remember. There's a yeah. rule to it. I, I yeah. can't remember. But things might be looking with all this flooding we've had this year pretty pretty good for uh, offshore fl- flotsam and jetsam. Uh, a few trees and stuff floating yeah. out there might be uh, around for next summer. The spa bass, as we yeah, saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. Yeah, no, we've seen everything off here. Uh, boats and, and fridges and spa bars and trees and what have you. And water tanks yeah 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 but certainly yeah got got dolphin fish off all of them so yeah certainly just put a, a different dimension on our our time when the water isn't quite good inshore in summertime it, it, you know, a lot of us have found our way doing that because we do have quite a, a large offshore tra- um, trap fishery off here for lobsters so there's a lot of offshore floats that are out there so yeah which act as fads benthos um tell me about what you guys are encountering on the bottom because you've got flat rock you've got all sorts of stuff here. You, how much sand are we talking from point to point? What are we looking at on an average? I'm guessing you've got a, a, a fair variety, but just give me a bit of an overview. Like if I'm heading out for a boat dive with you guys, what am I likely to encounter? Uh, kelpie reefs, um, patchy. patchy kelpie reefs, um, anything from you know a headland that will have a rock shelf that goes out 100 metres, everything down to some places the headland will go straight to sand and out. Um, but, yeah, one of the tricks I was taught about big white boulders in this area when I first started by Albie, actually, uh, was just look for the big, clean white boulders with no kelp on them and the, in between the boulders the fish will think you can't see them and they're just sitting in the cracks there. So that was uh, a weird trick, but that's how we started on the coast. I don't know if that's still a... Just smashing wongs. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Wongs and broom and, and all the bread and butter species. So, yeah, uh, following talk. big white boulders. Albie, maybe you can talk to about this. Um, Central Coast sea lion seafood. Um, you guys obviously love to have a good feed. We're, we're, we're spearfishing for a reason. What, what have you seen in the club over the years with regards to culinary talent? Uh, there's been some absolutely fantastic chefs in the club, really. Um, we've had um, some great cook-ups. We normally have a good cook-up at the yearly Christmas party and we always get some dolphin fish or some Andrew's always got some jewfish or someone's done a trip up the coast and got some Spanish mackerel or coral trout left over from a reef trip. So, yeah, we've always always ate really well. Yeah. Um, and the diamond head cook-up. Yeah, diamond head cook-ups are famous as well. We've get yeah, abalone and craze and everyone's eating hundred dollars a kilo food. Yeah, and we're just having <laughs> fun much, with our mates. Pretty much, pretty much yeah. get sick of it after after yeah, a weekend. Yeah. You eat that much of it. Yeah. So we even at one stage had a um, a, a person who was um, a member of our club that actually didn't die. Yeah, he used to just come along and actually just um, cook for us. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah, yeah, so. Funny you. You made a comment before that um, we're all in really good shape, but you see my missus is arguing the differ. <laughs> I'm getting round on. I said, but I'm bringing you all these nice lobsters. <laughs> covered in butter and cheese. Isn't that good? Oh, no. What are they, Back to the uh, gym you go. What, what do they say? Something like the, the sweet of the... What is it? The something the berry? I can't remember. 
Yeah, don't worry about it, bro. It's the middle-aged <laughs> life. Dad life. That's what I've got to say. Um, it's hard to eat so much seafood and stay skinny. I don't know how I'll be still in it. Especially when you're covered in garlic butter. Like, it's hard, man. Like, there's a way I need to know. <laughs> yeah. You guys do much abs around here? Yeah. I love abs. I'm real partial to them. Like, but some people like just seem to be ab snobs. I, I, li- I like them. Just give me your abalone. <laughs> no, nah, I reckon I rate them. They're pretty good. Even in like a little noodle dish, they, they go all right. What? Yeah. Give, give us your ab go-to. What's this noodle dish? Um, I'd probably sl- I'd slice it pretty thin. Yeah. And then I have it just in like a, um, just in the wok with some of those Japanese mushrooms. They kind of come in like a dried Shiitake. packet. Yeah, that's the one. So you yeah, kind of put yeah. them in the, um, in the water and they kind hydrate of- Hydrate them. Hydrate them, yeah, gets all yeah. the juice out. Then I just kind of poach it Activated, in the juice. Activated, I think they call yeah, it. Yeah, something like that. And then yeah, yeah. a bit of um, oyster sauce as well in oh, there. Oh, yeah, So you yeah, kind of yeah, have yeah. that juice from the, um, from the shiitake mushrooms yeah. and a bit of oyster sauce. It's a really so distinct like a broth. flavor, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and it goes really good with the abalone. So that's Ooh, a nice little winter one. That's good. I still love them just diced. Um, and just smashed in some garlic butter for 45 seconds, boom, we're eating it. No tenderizing, nothing. Straight out of the shell, shuck them, cut them, boom, straight in the garlic butter for 45 seconds. Even with like a really simple pasta, so like... Um, Linguine or, or a even, yeah, carbonara. Little, um, a little shell pasta, and you just kind of have that with the butter, the garlic, some fresh capers Ooh. and parsley, and just kind of fry the abalone in there, and you've got the pasta already cooked. As soon as the abalone starts to curl up, off the heat and toss your pasta through it and just have that with a bit of parmesan, like freshly grated on top. It's do good. Do you reckon it would be cool to have a Spiro restaurant? Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Because, like, Spiros have got like, – and just with 99 Spiro recipes, I'm not self-promoing the book here at all. <laughs> um, but like so many Spiros have got some really interesting recipes, you know. Like we we get fresh seafood every day of the week, and uh, and have an absolute blast doing all sorts of stuff with it. So it sounds like you're one of those guys. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm that good to make to to do that. But uh, look, I like to give it a red hot crack in the kitchen. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So we were talking benthos, and Albie had a point about white boulders. What are your other tips in this area, Albie? Uh, I think. Just on the Central Coast generally, we're pretty blessed with the amount of reef we have mm. all the way from you know from the Hawkesbury to to the top end of the coast. There's just continuous reef, and as far out to sea as you can sort of go. We've only got a little bit of a sort of sandy area off Avoca. Um, is that it, where the artificial's going? It is actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the rest of the um, every headland and you know for probably a k out to sea or more, we have reef. So wherever you go, there's different types of terrain you can dive and boulders and kelp and so we're just absolutely blessed with the amount of reef we've got here do you guys forage much uh, like kelp sea, sea, seaweed stuff like that is, is that something you guys uh, investigate we don't tend to get many fish on the kelp here yeah everything terms tends to be on the rocks or on the sandy headlands so any any time you see the kelp it's not very productive it seems to be um more so the boulders and those sandy headlands where you get the the rocks and the wash our urchin barren Barrens a thing down here? Yeah, I think so. I think so, but I don't know. It might. I mean, most of the areas might have already been like that. I don't yeah, know. Right. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's declined. You know. Well, James was talking about he thinks slightly rising ocean temps is changing things, and uh, yeah, it's possible. The urchin are hanging on for longer, and they they're pr- poor. They're not good to eat, but yeah. they they just stay alive and they they kill everything. Yeah, I don't notice any you know reduction in habitat like that since I've started diving here. I noticed. I've noticed a few spots there's not as many fish as what there used to be, but in general, it hasn't really changed in, in, in 20 years since I've been diving. It stayed the same. There's still plenty of fish out there and obviously comes and goes with the season. So, Do, you, do, do any of you guys get pissed off with Sydney's siders coming up and smashing your fish when they're on mm, weekends Not particularly. Away? You hardly ever see them, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. 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 yeah, right. Eh? enough, it's not far as the crow flies, but it's um, a long drive to go all the way from Sydney to here. So when they do come for a comp or whatever, um, they, they make the time to, to actually come up, but it's it's a long time for them to come up here when they have access to so much other areas in Sydney. Um, so, yeah, we don't really get too many Sydney ciders come up here. Because, um, I mean, that's that, that's a big, a big thing with any fisher, isn't it? It's population pressure. Because, like, even if a very small fraction of the people do it, like... I get you get it with spots, you know. Like in Southern Queensland, we've got a Facebook group with about thirteen or fourteen thousand people. Some new guy gets on, not knowing any better, says, "Hey, where can I go spearfishing?" There's only half a dozen spots. 
you know, for shore based spots in southern Queensland because we just got that little ground. The guy lists the two or three spots, thinking he's helping this young guy out. 13,000 people were looking at that. If 100 pers- people show up at each of those spots, that's more, way more pressure than some of those spots can take in one single sitting. And so it, it, it can be affected for a month. And I'm like, I, I love spearfishing. We are sustainable, we are selective. But 100 sparrows on a single reef, like we, if everyone takes one fish each, that's a lot of fish taken out, demersal species off one reef. Um, so I was thinking for you guys, if Sydney side has come up for a weekend, like sometimes it could be an extra bit of pressure on your fishery that may be unwelcome. Oh, look, probably not as much due to the fact they probably wouldn't bother making the trip. Um, there's probably a few things in our favour as well because there's so much ground, so little spiros on the coast. Yeah. Um, look, a, a couple of people have made the mistake before of taking a couple of big fish and putting the background in the photo and, uh, yeah, got a, a whinge from the locals. But um, generally as well, the fizz is better in Sydney um, and a few people have got some anecdotal ideas but most of us think it's because the Hawkesbury swing swings northeast as it comes out um, so generally we can have Sydney cider diver uh, Sydney ciders um, reporting 15 meters of viz and we've only got four or five here oh wow um, so they're not going to yeah so they're not going yeah, so to yeah, right bother right. coming up here so yeah. uh yeah so when I come down here and I'm smashing my trophy wong <laughs> and I hold up my fish with the in New South Wales. Oh, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. And this is what Trick's famous for. And I hold up my trophy Wong. How do I blur that background out so other people can't find that spot? Because I don't want people coming in to take my Wongs next time I come here. <laughs> uh, you found a photo. <laughs> yeah. So how do you blur out the background though? Seriously, like what apps are you using? What, how are you? Because d- the other thing with those photos, and some people know and some people don't, if you take a photo with a smartphone, it, it's got the GPS coordinates in the metadata of that photo. Yeah. Yeah? So how do I disguise some of my footprints to make sure other people aren't coming to rape my spots? Here we go. Tomo's got something. Don't post it. Well, that, that's one thing. Don't post it. Take a screen. So take your photo. Take a screenshot of that photo. Oh, yeah, Go nice. to post it to social media, and then you, you have the editing tools where you can scribble and write things. Yeah. Just scribble out any landmarks. Scribble out your face, anything like that, so they can't recognise you when you when you get that over a metre uh, flatty. No. And, and cast, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, it's, not, it's not August yet. <laughs> uh, um, so when you get that over metre flatty, um, people can't recognise you and cast dispersions about taking three big metre. breeders and things like that. Yeah. really good. You can even scribble your wong into a nice snapper. <laughs> oh, a bit of Photoshop love. <laughs> All right. Love it. I think also is um, a lot of the people who, who might come up here from Sydney, I mean, it's we, we're sparrows. No, no one's going out to smash everything. It's, yeah. it's, it's summertime a lot of time when people come here, we're targeting the, the fish. And look, I you know, certainly welcome um, the opportunity for people to come up here. And There's nothing better than being at the boat ramp and seeing some guys who might be from Sydney. It's like, what did you get, boys? They're all part of the brotherhood. So I wasn't picking on Sydney ciders. I was just having a quick ask. I thought I'd see if there was any any bad blood there. But you guys have shined them all. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do Talking about jet skis, we got the vintage jet ski.com man down here. So, here we got Mark's got something. I was just going to say, being being from Sydney originally, to, to, to do the you know roughly hour and a half trip to the central coast, a lot of the Sydney boys are just going, you know what, we might skip the central coast and go to Port Stephens. It's an hour further, but it just seems to be a lot more productive. Cleaner water? Cleaner water, better water, better fish. A lot of the time, more more to shoot. Oh. Uh, Look at so, this misdirection going on here. The so yeah, guys, yeah. the viz is shit yeah, here, so, and yeah. there's yeah. better fish yeah, in Port, Port Stevens. <laughs> Some real dirty, subtle yeah. tricks here. I'm loving white, it. Full of great white sharks here. As well. Yeah, <laughs> great white sharks no, as well, mate. Yeah. Do you like to penetrate? Great news, penetrator fins. Today's Noob Spirit podcast sponsor are tough as nails, robust, dependable performers with beyond industry standard warranty. Communicate direct with Larry and his team 24-7 for all your fin inquiries at penetratorfins.com or at penetratorfins on Instagram. Baby spun finish. These things are smooth as silk. They glide through the water. They give you that awesome balance between power and efficiency. This is Penetrator Fins. Use the code Anoob Spiro to save $25 on any 
pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. That's right, use the code NoobSpero to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Killshot's spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American-made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Killshot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. One thing I've learned about a lot of Sydney ciders is they, they say fooled instead of field. Well, how do you say field? Field. Oh, <laughs> bit of yeah. Gus Gould in there, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, nah, awesome. Okay, cool. So we've got Benthos. I, I really want to get a, just a quick story from everyone. Like, let's go for sort of that 90-second mark. Tell me something scary that's happened to you or a fish you're really proud of or the one that got away. I'm the second person in Australia to have a particular infection that might live in your wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is interesting. So I, um, I was in a comp and I uh, was getting back onto the boat and instead of stupidly handing over my gun, I just had it by my side and uh, the gun slipped. Um, as I was getting onto the boat, I basically lurched onto the tip of the gun, um, onto the tip of the spear and it went down the side of my ankle um, all the way down to the flopper, about that, you know, about that far. And um, yeah, pushed the wetsuit into there. Uh, had it cleaned out the next day um, and then four or five weeks of pretty intense infections and I ended up with a pretty antibiotic resistant infection uh, four weeks later and like I now a staph, have a, a staph infection type uh, it was a similar like a MRSA type um, infection but yeah I had it cleaned out the whole way down from the top of my ankle to the bottom is it pretty bad there Cam can we get a photo for the show notes yeah um, <laughs> Yeah, I had it. I'll chuck a photo in of um, of uh, his uh, STD that he's blaming on a wetsuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, the the first person to ever get it was a lady who got crushed up into the rocks while she was surfing. Um, had the same thing, a wetsuit go inside the wound. Wow. And uh, yeah. It was so about... that's something peculiar to neoprene and coming into contact with your... The um, infectious... Disease doctors weren't hard, even 100% sure, but uh, it seemed to do something with wetsuits and being pushed inside, yeah. it, being in the wrong place. And yeah. a Sydney weekend trip with uh, STIs. <laughs> yeah, the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Sydney, Thailand, same, same. Um, all right, cool. Um, oh, for me, it probably would have been one of my first um, away comps we had up at Shoal Bay. And... The spot that we were rock hopping because there was a lot of swell, it was a 2K walk and then a 1.5K swim. And it was the biggest mission I've ever done to date to get out there anyway. Um, you came out looking like Albie, didn't you? Oh, mate, I was looking ripped as. Yeah. Was, <laughs> 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 and, yeah, anyway, shot one of my um, personal best kingfish up there around about 18 kilos or something like that. And um, I was probably just hanging on to him for a bit long and just trying to sort the shaft out and all that kind of thing. And next minute I looked down and I had this solid um, bronze whaler just swimming vertically straight up with its mouth open. And Bronzy or dusky down Dusky here? whaler, I think it is. Okay, yeah, yeah right so right. I think Because a bronze whaler is a, a cold They're water. They're a bit colder water, yeah. yeah. And I had this discussion with Saka the other day and he was speculating that most of the shark encounters that people think are bronzies are still duskies because yeah, the water is so, just too hot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they are still a spooky fish. Mate, it was, yeah, he was hungry and he was keen. And he actually had this big gash mark on top of his head where something else had actually had a go at him too. So, um, yeah, that was probably my first proper shark experience and that coming up and having to give him a couple of jabs just to kind of get him away. But I think I was lucky I kind of had the... Were you solo? Yeah, I had another guy that was... Um, a, couple hundred meters away from me so at this point in time i'd like drifted well off the off the headland and i was out pretty far um because the current was ripping through where we were and were you, um did you get that kingy on a on a bit of a pressure point and then you were drifting off yeah that's so i shot fish. it and yeah, then it right was kind right. of just giving me a bit of grief and i was just playing him out for a while and by that time i'd got him up and then dispatched him i was uh, pretty far away any lessons learned what would you do differently knowing um, what you do now 
I probably wouldn't walk out there again. This was just that far. The walk back. So we had what like... What a weight belt and all your stuff, oh, eh? We had one of the other guys carry our gear and I was just carrying this big like lump of kingfish through the soft sand and I remember getting back and just thinking this is the most exhausting thing I've ever done. But yeah. I think the funny part of that was the shark that was actually giving me a bit of a bad time ended up peppering a few other blokes in the club as well on the way back in. So maybe a bit of a resident. Yeah, I think so. That could be learned behaviour too, like... Here's a free feed. Well, at the time, I was thinking in my, in my head, like, you know, I'm not going to give this fish up. Like, this is this is a PB. This guy's coming home with me. I want the glory. Did and you ecky him before yeah. the shark come around? Yeah, so I'd yeah, ecky right him right. and then, like, let it out. And then at that time, like, because I had it on the real line, it was just um, everywhere. So it just took me forever to kind of just get it all back together. And I remember it was as soon as I clipped the, sh um, the shaft straight it back into the gun, it goes, jink. I looked down and this thing was just coming straight up. So usually, you know, I wouldn't spend that long sitting in that pool of bloody water, playing into my gun. I'd be swimming back to the headland or something like that. So that was definitely a little... At least the up. fish was icky because the, the movement of those struggling fish when you got them on the end of the spear, that seems to be the dinner bell. The, yeah. blood, the blood, not so much. Not so much, yeah. Definitely kind of, you know, bashing around the bottom there. Yeah, you're ringing that bell pretty hard. Nice king, mate. And I, I sometimes think those fish that you work your ass off for, they taste the best. Well, I, was, I was hoping that it wasn't going to be mushy. Yeah. So Was it mushy? No, it wasn't. <laughs> and that's the thing. I was just like, man, if I walked this and swam this king all the way back to shore yeah. and then it was mushy, I would have been pretty upset. But no, nah, lucky it was, um, yeah, pristine, really healthy fish. Plugging Eric for carrying your gear back. Yeah. <laughs> Fellas, uh, these stories, they don't have to be dramatic either. Just a lesson learned, like Simon's story with an injury or whatever. Like, um, it's all really interesting stuff. Oh, while we're, while we're talking shark stories, yeah, right. I'm Here not sure go. if I've... I don't know if I told you this one before um, when I did the interview with you, but um, I, was, I was diving up off um, Stradbroke Island. I've only dived up there a couple of times and and the water was crystal clear on the top but it had that sort of thermocline where you drop down about... Nine mile? No, this is on the on the Straddy. Yeah, Stradbroke. Which, which reef were you um, Could have been... Sevens. It might have been the Sevens. I don't know. There was a bommy there. I don't remember the name of the place, but... There's a lot of lot of fish around, a lot of sharks around, a lot of. It was really dirty on the bottom. Had that sort of really dirty layer, right. and uh, I've actually seen a few yellowfin tuna, like little ones. Oh and wow! A few few bits and pieces, and anyway, we went back up for another drift, and I hadn't even speared a fish, and we had a bit of burly. We were burling up, and a shark came off the bottom out of the gloom. It was a bull shark. A bull shark. Probably, I don't think it was massive. It might have been seven or eight foot, I suppose. Massive. Um, That's so massive. We, well, it came came off the bottom. Charles yeah. was actually on the surface. I had my gun pointing down, which was loaded. The shark came straight up, and I, I just it just happened that quick. I sort of had the gun there ready to sort of poke it away, but it sort of missed the gun, and it came straight up and actually hit me in the chest and launched me out of the water, and I actually got winded. It hit me that hard with its snout. Hard. So it they had a reputation there for a long time, and it's still a, one of those sort of places. Yeah. yeah, so it's the only time I've ever been actually ran by a shark, and it winded me. And the boat, anyway, the boat came over, and I couldn't breathe. I'm going, uh, uh, and he's like, "What happened?" I said, "You don't want to know." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I lived. It didn't bite me, luckily, so I lived to tell the tale. When you're out on those reefs, like a good boaty is worth their weight yeah. in gold. Like yeah. someone that can get over to you fast and yeah. move you. Yeah. Even if it's a couple of hundred meters. It's just, yeah. yeah. I've dived with plenty of bull sharks, but that's the only time I've ever had an incident like that. I've had them take fish and stuff. But dirty water seems to be a trigger for them. Yeah. What do you think? Yep. That bullies, eh? Yep. Yeah. That was clean water though. It was clean on the top, crystal clear, maybe even twenty, maybe thirty meter vis on the on the surface, but it still had that dirty layer, that bottom down about twenty meters was about one meter vis on the bottom. You say little shark, because they do get they do get much bigger, yeah. but seven or eight foot shark's gonna do some damage. It's probably the little ones you gotta watch out for, I think, too. Yeah, they're stupid, eh? Yeah. They the don't little. they don't have that learned yeah. caution. That's right. That the bigger ones do. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. look at look at Evan. He got bit by a four foot, yeah, five foot one. So oh yeah. It's the little ones you got to watch. That's a good story, eh? It's not the big ones, yeah. You know Evan pretty well. Yeah, I know Evan. Yeah, great guy. Mate, he's a he's a he's yeah, a champion. He's an absolute lovely guy. Good to hear him getting back on his feet again. He's back spearing again pretty much every day. So yeah, he'll be there on he'll be there on Saturday night. So yeah. What do we got here, Tomo? Tomo. Uh, lessons learnt. Uh, I've had no real shark encounters, but a local spot here, Three Mile. Uh, normally there's a fair bit of current uh, and viz is not the great, but when the viz is great and there's no current, you head out there. 
So the lesson I have learned in a friend's boat is always make sure that you have enough chain out on your anchor uh, line. What's your rule? Uh, I just put shit loads out. <laughs> <laughs> and, Some and people say like at least double like your... I, I'd say probably three or four times. Double your whole length and chain and then... Double your chain and rope or whatever it is. And then one of the – in in my boat, if I anchor up, one of the first things I always do is dive down to make sure that my reef anchor has set. Yeah. Um, this was on a friend's boat, didn't do that. And uh, diving for quite a while, did a dive, come up, look around for the boat, no boat. <laughs> Uh, so it was a long swim that day. Yeah. You caught up with it eventually? Oh, definitely. Sometimes the current moves counter wind too. So the boat's going in one direction. Don't matter what you do, you're going in the other direction. Lucky it wasn't one of those days. It hadn't drifted a, a great deal, I'll yeah. say, but we actually um, had trouble finding it because of the chop. Because yeah. you've actually got to wait for the chop to sort of lift you up and hopefully your boat's not in a trough. The blokes you dive with when you're skipper and you're boaty, Let's say you've got three divers. What's, what do you tell them before they jump off the back of your boat about sticking together or what, what's your rule of thumb? Because as soon as I get divers 100 metres apart and I'm in any sort of chop, I'm picking someone up and I'm moving them to the others. Uh, I'll normally advise them to sort of stay in the same direction. Yeah. Uh, I don't normally set a, a distance parameter, but uh, I do explain to them that if one goes left and one goes right, it's very hard to keep an eye on, on them. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we had a diver up in Port Stephens. I think we were in Al's boat at the time and we had to go looking for him and, and we nearly engaged another boat to start looking for him. Um, he's a gun diver. He'd just gone off by himself around a, around a, uh, like a, um, a rocky island. And um, yeah, we, we were not happy. We spent ages looking for him, and he was a, in the water oblivious. Really. Yeah, scary so, shit, isn't it? So one of the other things is set a time frame. So we'll be here for about an hour or an hour and a half, things like that, and then come back to the boat. And so, and, and if I'm in the water, uh, we've anchored up, I'm always looking back towards the boat to make sure I've got sight of it and looking for other divers' floats. Last question, Tom. When you anchor up in, in a little bit of current, uh, uh, do you guys always swim up current? Do you try and anchor up down current so that that way you don't have the hectic swim back to the boat? So generally, um, I don't really make too much of a decision about where I where I anchor for that uh, that reason, but uh, because I, I've done bubblehead courses as, as well, um, normally they'll tell you to go against the current, use up all your strength, and then. It, you can actually drift back, and and I, um, while I don't impart that on other divers, um, that's what I tend to do. Yeah, cool, awesome, thank you. Equalising problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the either the Friends or an Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalisation course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Shrek, my dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face Apparel or getting a subscription to the world's greatest spearing magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. All right. Who's got another lesson learned or a scary story? Andrew, Mark. Being uh, fairly new still to the game, I haven't had um, any real experience with proper sharks, we'll call it. Um, but I Not have... that you've seen them. 
Not, so oh, I have seen some. <laughs> I, I haven't had any sort of uh, run-ins yeah. with them. But I have actually had locally here a pretty aggressive seal um, that's basically sort of pushed us back inshore and taken our fish and, yeah, really sort of given us a fair bit of grief. Because they, they get pretty big, that couple of hundred kilo. Yeah, I reckon this one would have been, you know, 250, 300 kilo, Ooh. a big seal. Yeah. Um, and diving with a mate of mine and, yeah, took all our fish. Yeah. And, yeah, really didn't want us in the water at all. But, um, yeah, that's the only only sort of running I've had with something aggressive so far, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. So in that in that case, though, so you just went with it and you were just like, righto, this thing is not, like, well, I'm just going to listen to what he's telling yeah, us. So yeah, move. well, he, he took our fish first and he was basically on our fins the whole way back to shore. All right, just so, yapping. Yep. Yeah, on our fins, sort of swimming straight up to us and then just darting away at the end. Um, but, yeah, like, I mean... Posh it up, they're scary yeah. animals. That, that's their environment too. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. not meant to be there. We, you can never move as well as they can. Yeah, that's right. And so, uh, so yeah, it's like Joan Alamo. <laughs> to be on a rugby field with John Alamo or something. Yeah. yeah. All right, blokes. I've had a fantastic time. Did anyone else have a last story, Andrew? I think um, one of the important lessons is certainly the um, the importance of a baity when you're diving. So I can certainly reflect on a few instances there. And, it, you know, there was the, the time, Al, back in uh, the year 2000 on the Canimbla, and uh, where I was as part of the search party looking for Al, swept out to sea from <laughs> oh, um, from Sumerez Sumer Reef. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, Beatty, um, his baity didn't have his, his eye on the game at the time, someone that didn't usually dive. Um, but anyway, that all ended well. Um, and then likewise, um, on that same trip, I remember, I remember uh, shooting a good sized dog tooth tuna. It just took my whole rig line, gun and everything, just took it into a cave. Like it was unbelievable how this thing just did a U-turn and went into this massive cave you can park a cave in. And you know, my gear and everything's in there. So you got the opportunity to call the boat over and try and get, you know, my heart was beating, but try and get one of my dive partners to um, get the boat, get up current, dive down and actually retrieve my gun out of the out of the cave. Uh, it ripped off in the cave um, there. And then we do, as I said there before, we do a lot of fad diving like here and you can, you know, have, have younger guys come out here and you've got to be careful they don't get preoccupied with trying to throw fishing lures around while you're diving out there with current because you can hook a good sized fish and yeah, and, and, and lose your eye on your divers and, and what have you. So, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, it's actually quite a demanding job when you're a boatie. Very like good. you're running interference if there's other boaties around. You're saying, hey, look, oi, there's the, that's the line of the marine park or whatever it is. You, we want to stay 100 metres off it. The current sometimes just starts dragging you towards it. Yep. Um, there's, always, there's always stuff to do. There's, pass me another got, gun. <laughs> yeah, 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 pass me another gun. Yeah, yeah. Clean blood and shit off the deck. Bleed or gutter fish that hasn't been done. The, the boaty is, as far as I'm concerned, a really important job. You've got to get people on the right spot on the drift. If, if, you're, if you're 20 metres off, you might as well not even drift some spots in Brisbane. Yeah, that's so. an important point you made there as well about um, with other boats. You know, certainly here, Central Coast and also, um, you know, in Sydney, in that, that area, there's a lot of boats on the water now. And it's a very important part of the, you know, to keep that boat the, the, the dive boat basically in that right position that strategically it sort of prevents other boats from sort of cutting you off and, and running your drivers, uh, you know, your divers over and the like. Fantastic, guys. Awesome chat. This is uh, fantastic. I've enjoyed. Simon, thank you very much for organising uh, this at short notice. Um, boys, we've had, I've had a ball. Where can people find out more about the Central Coast Sea Lions? Um, how can people get in touch with the club? Uh, mate, we've got an Instagram page at the moment, it's the Central Coast Sea Lions, and on there it's got our email address, and you can shoot us an email if you'd like um, any other inquiries. We've got our membership forms and stuff there as well available. We've also got a Facebook page, um, which is just Central Coast Sea Lions, and it's got on there like our calendar. So it's got our dive days on there. It's got our club meetings when they're on, and it's also got the yeah, membership forms and stuff like that. You're the current serving president. Is there a way that you could get all of the clubs to put all of their shit on one calendar for all of Australia? <laughs> oh, mate, that's a pretty big, pretty big job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nah. <laughs> See, I always leave a shit stir question for the end of the interview. Mate, you put me under some hot pressure here. <laughs> I'll, I'll lay down the they challenge. They might not vote me in next month. Now. <laughs> Nah, guys, I've had a blast. Um, check out Central Coast Sea Lions on Instagram, Central Coast Sea Lions on Facebook. These guys are doing an awesome thing. They've got a very active club, a lot of experienced guys willing to take out new guys, new girls. Um, this is a growing lifestyle, and these guys do this thing right. 
and uh, there's no better way than to learn from um, a couple of mentors. So awesome. Thank Simon. you very much for coming down and stopping by. It's great to have you here and uh, I hope you can join us in the future. 100%. Let's Thank do you. it. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the Central Coast Sea Lions. Proud patrons of the Noob Spiro podcast. If you want to become a patron listener, go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Massive thanks to you guys uh, for all of your efforts listening, sharing the podcast. It's always appreciated. Thanks for the reviews and buying shirts and just showing your support however you do so. I always appreciate it. If you want to leave a voice message again for the community special coming up, go to noobspiro.com, head up into the menu, Nooba Stories, leave me a voice message. That would be a massive. Next week, we wrap up the East Coast Australia tour with a huge interview I did live in the Adreno Sydney store. Um, care of Craig and his team down there, a bunch of absolute legends. Gunther Pringle, uh, an unknown guy. He's, get, he's, uh, he's older now, um, but very experienced comp diver. We have a very lively chat. He's a very interesting guy. He set the powerboat speed record with his dad between Tasmania and Melbourne and some of the loose stories in this podcast, I'm telling you. So come back in one week's time. Gunther Pringle, thanks for your support. Catch ya. Today's episode was an absolute banger and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in store at some of their huge mega stores Australia wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. The NoobSpear podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They've got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPIRIT, neptonics.com. Neptonics.com.